Coming up on episode 42 of Omnivore, a new era in risk management, the tangled debate over ultra-processed foods, and tech-enabled traceability tips. This is Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by Calsec. Visit calsec.com to uncover new ways to create clean products that look better, taste better, and last longer, naturally, with Calsec. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. For most of us, the food we choose to put into our bodies is a very personal, even intimate choice. And thinking about the safety of the ingredients in that food can trigger some emotional responses as we wonder, is this safe for me to eat? Those questions are becoming even more confusing as states in the U.S. like California enact or consider bans on ingredients that the Food and Drug Administration has already determined are safe to consume. Such bans are predicated on different perceptions of risk management. Steve Havlick consults with IFT on a number of projects, including those focused on global food standards. He recently spoke with Food Technologies Mary Ellen Kuhn about various approaches to assessing the risk of food additives and the rationale for differing perspectives on managing risk versus hazards. Steve, thanks so much for joining the Omnivore podcast today. I was hoping that we could talk about the idea of risk versus hazard, which are two different ways of thinking about the safety of food additives and how one is a European perspective and one is a U.S. perspective. Could you tell us about that? Um, Sure, I'd be glad to tell you about it. So um, when you think about those two different ways, there's the European perspective. I'll start with that, which is based on what we uh, call the precautionary principle. And it's basically, uh, if there's a potential hazard that exists um, and there's any scientific data that might indicate that there is that potential uh, of a hazard to human health, um, then in their view, it needs to be regulated. Okay, So that's generally the way that that works, right? Um, wherever the scientific data is coming from, most often it can be from government-funded or directed research. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be broad-based, um, but that's generally how they approach the precautionary uh, principle, as we call it. If there is a potential hazard that exists to human health from the consumption of a food additive um, or a, a food in general, um, they will generally want to regulate it, okay? okay. Um, that's contrasted with the U.S. perspective, which I'll get to in a minute. A good example, I think, for us to use today is titanium dioxide which is a food additive ingredient that the EU has banned. The United States has not. And I, I think it's, it's noteworthy to talk about that one in the context of this. Um, they sponsored research um, on uh, titanium dioxide and identified that nanoparticles of titanium dioxide um, below a certain size are actually something that could cause damage to human health. And um, that is the basis um, that damage uh, is the basis of the uh, the issue and why they did the regulation that there was this potential to to cause cancer basically the U.S. approach to get to that is really more of a historical stance of building off of scientific evidence um, of human health impact that has to have a significant a wide review of um, scientific literature. Um, and has to be shown to be substantially uh, of concern to human health. It could be based on animal studies, which is what um, often you'll find with the European studies, but usually they want to see something also of some indication that there's the potential for human health from actual you know, human data. Okay? Um, so the FDA uh, stance is much more uh, of, a, of a longer term. It takes longer to develop, um, review the scientific literature, et cetera. So they're generally slower about the process of reviewing things than is Europe. Now, that said, um, it's different from the precautionary principle in that for them, there must be an actual hazard identified, okay, that is is actually causing 
known to cause human uh, health issues. That's how the FDA will tend to approach it. So that's the difference between the two, I would say. Well, that's a great explanation of that. Um, is there any backstory behind this whole geographic divide in, in perspective on this matter? Um, I, I don't know that there's a, a, a great backstory. Um, I think it's how things have evolved over time. Um, there's there's a, a general concern, I think, from the European vantage point um, about um, wanting to make sure that their populations are not exposed to anything harmful. Um, not that the FDA isn't that way, but the FDA, um, I think, has a much higher standard of scientific proof that they require for that. Um, where, again, in Europe, if, if the potential even exists to cause harm, then they're, they're concerned, okay? And, and they want to protect their, their population to that degree, okay? The question is, is that degree a good thing? Uh, or, or not for, you know, humanity as a whole around the globe. Um, you know, these, they, those are the questions. Just like, is the FDA approach the, the, the best for, for the, the population that they serve? Well, one of the reasons that this is especially relevant right now is because California has in, enacted a food safety ban on four food additives, and other states are considering similar legislation. So mm -hmm. that's a more risk-adverse approach. I'm wondering, right. yes, I'm wondering what impact might state level bans uh, have on how food companies approach product development? Okay. Well, I, I think the state level bans could have a significant effect on, and are already having a significant effect on how food companies in the U.S. and elsewhere, companies that are importing into the U.S. will, will have to address um, the use of food additives. Um, they will basically drive industry to look for alternatives, okay, because they would rather replace something with an alternative that they can use across the board that is viewed as safe um, uh, across all the states, as opposed to um, trying to design products that are, you know, specific to California or New York or any of these states that are uh, attempting to implement these, uh, these things. And, and really, the state-level bans that are really driven, I think, by a concern about is the FDA really protecting uh, the, the population's health appropriately? I think that's where the concerns lie. And they, uh, I think, are coming to the conclusion within their states and their legislatures that that is not necessarily the case in their view. And so they're going to do their own thing to protect their own state's population. I'm wondering if you think we're going to see more of this kind of state level action. I, I think it's likely in the short term. Uh, I, I believe that uh, until the FDA is perceived by those states as being an organization they feel like they can trust, um, then I think we're going to likely see more of that. I am hopeful that Jim Jones' appointment to lead the restructured FDA human foods organization um, will start to transition that trust level back towards um, you know the FDA being viewed as is is more trustworthy uh, to to those states um, that said you know I I think if you go back to the where these states are getting their you know their viewpoints from it is predominantly coming from the European um, decisions that have been made so they're picking up that you know the European Union has said that you know, for example, titanium dioxide is not okay, so therefore we need to ban it because we don't trust that the FDA is doing enough on the subject. If I could take a minute, I'd like to actually talk about the titanium dioxide um, scenario because I really think it's indicative of um, what we're, we're dealing with. You know, the, I, I mentioned about the nanoparticles and all of that. The global scientific consensus, and by that I mean many countries reviewing, um, is that there is virtually no risk of harm from titanium dioxide consumption uh, for human beings uh, in food, as long as you're using food-grade titanium dioxide. The actual um, test studies that were done in the EU um, were done um, with uh, titanium dioxide materials that had nanoparticles in them um, by design. They knew that they had nanoparticles in them. If you go to the food industry and ask for titanium dioxide as an ingredient, you're not going to get a product that has the, the, those small nanoparticles in it um, because they're filtered out by the way that it's manufactured. So fundamentally, the size range thing becomes not an issue. So if you actually take food-grade titanium dioxide 
um, and study that, which is what um, the United States, Canada, Japan, Australia, and even the UN uh, Food uh, and Agricultural Organization uh, JECFA uh, group did. They all did a re-review of titanium dioxide and discovered and came up with, we don't have any reason to change our statements that this is a safe uh, food additive. So when you look through that, that perspective of the global view, one has to ask the question, is the EU view that the states are promoting, okay, really the right view, or is there something else that we need to approach uh, uh, our evaluation of food additives with? And, you know, their concern about the FDA not being active enough, I think has some validity. I mean, I, I personally would say that of the five things that California originally proposed to ban, which by the way, they did not include titanium dioxide at the end of the day. Okay. And the reason they didn't was because they were presented with scientific data from all these countries that, um, yeah, it, it basically led them to say, hmm, maybe we shouldn't go down the path on this one. Okay. Um, but some of the ones that they banned, um, I actually think they had a valid, you know, valid scientific basis for some of them did not. It, it just depends. And, in some of the cases, the FDA was in a serious re-review of those and has already concluded that those are actually things that from an FDA level should be banned anyway. So um, as, as food additives. So it, it's, it is a complex situation, but I, I did want to take a moment to just kind of explain that titanium dioxide example um, and, and, and help people understand what the implications of that uh, have, have been and how that has played out over the the broader global scene. Well, I'm glad you did, because that's obviously in the news. There was just a big article and a major publication about it. And I think people think, oh, titanium dioxide, that's in sunscreen. So that sounds bad. Or it, it's actually in pharmaceutical pills that they use for, for whitening as a whitening agent, too. So you can find it in lots of places, but it's inert. That's really what it has been concluded. It's inert if you stay with within the construct of the level of the, the nanoparticles above a certain range. It's not showing any detriment to human health and lots of studies, including within people. So it, 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 it's, uh, I, I think, um, then what I would call a precautionary principle overreaction by the EU. And is the uh, titanium dioxide that's used in food products, that food grade titanium mm -hmm. dioxide? Has to be. Well, that explains a lot. Thank you, Steve, for sharing your thoughts. They were so valuable. My, my pleasure. Thank I was glad to be able to uh, help with that. Thank you. Steve Havlick is a retired food industry executive who's worked in manufacturing and R&D roles for several major companies and now consults with IFT on topics such as food standards and regulations. Check out the August issue of Food Technology to learn more about managing risk and evaluating the safety of food additives and ingredients. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment, but first, this word from our sponsor. Ready to discover what's naturally possible? Food and beverage brands are uncovering new ways to create clean products that look better, taste better, and last longer, naturally, with CalSec. Since 1958, CalSec's food scientists have been helping brands transform their products with technology for natural color, elevated flavors, and safer extended shelf lives. As dedicated partners, CalSec is there to guide you the whole way. Visit their website at calsec.com to connect with the CalSec team and find your path to natural products your customers will love and trust. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. From the moment Carlos Montero and his colleagues at the University of Sao Paulo debuted the Nova Food Classification System in 2009, it fueled an ongoing debate within every corner of the food and nutritional science communities around the basic legitimacy of the classifications, their relevance as nutritional tools, and the role of food manufacturers in formulating and marketing what NOVA classifies as ultra-processed foods. UPFs were the focus of a keynote panel discussion at last month's IFT First annual event and expo in Chicago. Meanwhile, IFT's peer-reviewed Journal of Food Science 
will be publishing a special edition on the topic this fall. Omnivore special contributor Mary Abode spoke with the journal's guest editor Mario Estevez Garcia about the science behind the debate and what needs to be done to properly engage the public in the discussion. You know, this is kind of a question just for the layperson like me, really, because I'm not a scientist. I don't have a science background. The term processing and processed when it comes to food, it kind of tossed around a lot without a lot of precision. What does it mean to you? What does that term process mean to you? And what are the possible distinctions between processing and ultra processing? I would say that um, it is not very well defined. In fact, this is probably one of the main issues uh, whenever we talk about ultra processing, considering that normally it is it is uh, understood that ultra processed foods are or they hold some kind of of risk of health risk, and they are not that uh, uh, they do not uh, display a very a very good uh, nutritional profile, and they can be harmful and so on. So. So basically, uh, it is essential to define uh, ultra processing. And right now, I think one of the most, there is no official uh, definition or classification or anything, but one of the most uh, common and probably uh, accepted classifications of foods according to the degree of processing is uh, the NOVA uh, classification, uh, which was proposed by a Brazilian uh, uh, food scientist. And this scientist made a classification in four different categories, and the most uh, and foods uh, subjected to the most uh, severe processing are uh, identified as ultra processing. And this involves basically, and this classification takes takes into consideration two different aspects. One is the number of uh, ingredients and additives. And whether these ingredients and also the additives, but most likely the ingredients are actually coming from ultra processing as well, because we can actually add, for instance, some some proteins which are coming from the isolate. Uh, or they are the isolate of a, of a, a unprocessed food, and the processing of uh, uh, in, involving the, the the isolation and the purification and so on of those proteins makes the isolate the protein isolate as an uh, ultra-processed ingredient. So if that is used for uh, the formulation of a uh, new food, so this new food could actually uh, be considered ultra-processed because some ultra-processed ingredients have been used for the formulation. And then the, uh, on the other hand, we have, we have in addition to the, to the number of ingredients and additives, we have the, the processing itself, so the industrial process. It is commonly used because there is no other, <laughs> to tell the truth, so this Brazilian Brazilian uh, scientist is quite popular and became very famous because uh, he proposed this classification. It has been used for a long time, but it, it has not been, let's say, like accepted or recognized by major or main uh, health institutions or the, the IFT or some uh, um, uh, institutions in the US or in Europe or any other part of the world. There is a very uh, uh, intense discussion among scientists whether this classification is good or not. And in, in some particular cases, uh, this discussion is, is of course, uh, the, the debate involves also industrial uh, partners and, uh, and some uh, the, in the food industry. The issue of ultra processed foods is a very complex one. And there is a lot of debate around the health impacts and necessity of ultra processed foods. What are the scientific truths on both sides? In my opinion, we can find uh, scientific truth on both sides. Other processed foods appear from the necessity of making our life easier. And they actually make our life easier. For instance, I'm thinking of uh, ready to eat foods. We don't have time mm -hmm. or we don't have knowledge, which is also relevant for preparing food. And we simply heat in the oven or in the microwave or in a bag. And th there it is, we have a complete meal in a very short period of time, uh, in a very easy uh, way. So, however, it is also true that there is a serious, and I believe scientifically based uh, concern on the health risks uh, 
of eating ultra processed foods or some uh, of certain certain uh, ultra processed foods. These ultra processed foods are stable. They have a long shelf life, and they, some of them they can actually be uh, stored for a long time at room temperature. So they we don't need even a uh, fridge, we don't need a, a, a freezer, and they are safe. Most of them because actually the processing is in a way one of the objectives is to guarantee a safety. So there are no pathogens. In, 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 in those foods. Mm -hmm. And they are tasty and they are appealing, most of them. And the main problem is that for making these ultra processed foods uh, stable, safe, and tasty, they are formulated with a number of ingredients and additives that they are subjected to very severe processing. And in some cases, the formulation and the severe processing are very likely behind the health concerns of these of some of these ultra processed foods. And that is the negative side of these foods, which is supported, as I said before, by scientific evidence in the, in the literature. So is it mm -hmm. possible to design and produce healthy ultra processed foods to keep the positive side and avoid the negative side, the health concerns? I think this is possible, but before we can do that, we need to understand which is exactly making these certain ultra-processed foods potentially harmful to humans. So not all ultra-processed foods display health concerns, I believe that. And we need to know which components, ingredients, additives, combination of additives, and which kind of processing or degree of processing is providing these ultra-processed foods with this negative side. What more do we need to understand and study about the effects of processing on foods and beverages? Well, that, that is very much connected to what I said uh, to, to what I said before. Because mm -hmm. to tell the truth, we know very little about ultra processed foods, so there is much to understand. Um, on this line, I think that innovation at industrial level uh, has been much faster than the understanding on how that processing could actually affect our health or the intake of that, those ultra processed foods could actually affect to our health. So that is why most of the reports on the connection between the intake of ultra processed foods and the, the onset of some particular health uh, issues or uh, uh, pathologies, um, they are based on epidemiological studies in which some particular food or, or dietary habits of a group of people is related to the occurrence of the prevalence of some particular diseases. But that connection many times lack a mechanism that provides reasoning and scientific strength. And that is exactly what, uh, what we need to achieve, uh, understanding the mechanisms. Are ultra-processed foods contributing to obesity or diabetes, for instance, according to the uh, epidemiological studies. Okay, so we need to identify which components of which ultra processed foods are specifically contributing to those uh, pathological conditions, which are mm -hmm. the pathophysiological mechanisms explaining such epidemiological connection. This is the key to find answers and solutions to this to this issue. Mario Estevez Garcia is a professor of food science and biochemistry at the University of Extremadura in Spain. He's a scientific editor at the Journal of Food Science and the guest editor of the special issue on ultra-processed foods to be released later this fall. You can read more of Mary's conversation with Mario in the Brain Food blog on IFT.org. The Tech Stack, a combination of technologies that are stacked one on top of the other to build an end-to-end -end application used to be a term solely used by software developers. But as industries like food production increasingly digitize their operations, its meaning has evolved to any technology system that a business uses to operate and optimize its processes. This concept is perhaps no better applied than to end-to-end -to -end traceability in the food value chain. Even though the US Food and Drug Administration's food traceability rule does not require data to be in digital form. The agency is encouraging the food industry to adopt digital solutions. But how do you choose which tech-enabled traceability solutions are right for your operation? 
To get a few tips, Food Technologies Julie Larson Brisher asked Margaret Dominguez, VP of Food Safety and Compliance with Solely Organic, where she leads development of enhanced technology for traceability. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Julie. You know, I'm really excited to, for you to give us the scoop on uh, tech enabled traceability today. I'm excited too to meet meet you and uh, discuss this uh, subject. Okay, let's get right into it. Um, as the only controlled environment producer that's built on soil based technology, it seems like solely organic started off pretty tech savvy. I imagine was that savviness helpful when FISMA two hundred four came out in terms of building your food traceability programs through tech enabled traceability tech applications? Absolutely. So solely organic is definitely very committed to advancing the produce industry by adapting cutting edge technologies across the board, including traceability systems that helps us ensure the highest food safety and quality standards. We are definitely ahead of um, many companies working towards meeting the FISMA 204 requirements. We are showcasing our dedication to both compliance and innovation through this process. So the company you know, is in the market for very long, for many years. Um, and we started in more outdoor growing, but as we start developing our growing system, um, we very quickly learned that we, that technology has to go with it. So, um, when FISMA 204, uh, was issued, uh, we jump in right away and start, um, looking at our system, improving our systems. Um, so we are very happy where we are right now across uh, the network of Soli, we have 15 different facilities through growing operations to packing houses. So the technology that we use for traceability is definitely very useful for us and beneficial to um, trace, the, trace the product between the facilities, but of course, between our suppliers, vendors, and our customers. Well, I know that Soli has several product lines, everything from culinary herbs to various salad greens. Um, does that complicate how you approach incorporating food traceability systems w with so many facilities and lines of products? Yes and no. So, I mean, it doesn't really matter if it's leafy green or, or herb. I mean, we will trace the same way. We have to know where the product came from, where it was grown, even which line in our facility, um, when it was harvested, when it was packed, when it was shipped. So I would say that um, it really doesn't matter if it's leafy green or, or herb. We will treat it the same way. So what kind of challenges have you overcome? Um, for example, what lessons were learned in implementing digital solutions in your traceability initiatives? Great, great question. So I think the, uh, there's few lessons learned definitely that we, that we had, to, I can mention here. So complex supply chain. Um, very quickly, we've learned that the product supply chain is in, inherently very complex and understanding this complexity is essential for implementing effective traceability solutions. Uh, data hygiene, that was a big one. Uh, we had to make sure that the data that's inputted in the system is correct and it's clean. Otherwise, the end result will not give you the correct information. And of course, cross-functional implementation of the system as well is not just food safety, it's not just compliance. Um, supply chain, um, operations, um, compliance, of course, we all have to work together to uh, implement the system that will work for everyone. Yeah. Have you guys been using the PTI through International Fresh Produce Association? That's correct. Yes, we are. Not for all customers, because not all customers are requiring that yet, but that's the future. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I heard a lot of people are... Uh, adopting that produce traceability uh -huh. um, initiative as well. That's correct. So what benefits do you get? I mean, we're talking FISMA is in place um, primarily to try to reduce the number of food recalls related to, and, and ultimately I think really reduce foodborne illness numbers. Uh -huh. um, but there are other benefits to digitizing uh, your systems and adding this element of traceability. So um, I know you're a food safety professional. 
Mm-hmm. So you may be able to give us some insight into how is is are those benefits really showing up in re- in the real world for the business? Absolutely. Um, I think operational excellence probably like a number one benefit. The digital system has led to operational excellence by streamlining processes and re- reducing errors in our operations. Improve supply chain visibility. Again, I've mentioned um, how complex that is. So have enhanced visibility to uh, where the product is coming from, when it's shipped, how it's stored, where it's packed and harvested. It's it's just improved tremendously. And the last benefit would be easily accessible data. Having easily accessible data means we can quickly retrieve necessary information, which is crucial for compliance and decision making. And of course, we have to have that data ready for FDA to provide within 24 hours. What should a company really look for in an ideal system building mode? Right. I think each company just needs to do a proper research and find ways and system that fit their operation. There's so much available on the market right now with you know, digitalized systems, or even if you can do it manually on an Excel spreadsheet, if that fits your day-to-day operation, then that that's fit your day-to-day operation. But there's just so many different options available, and you just need to find the right one that fits your company. Margaret Dominguez is Vice President of Food Safety and Compliance at Solely Organic an indoor soil-based agriculture company that produces organic herbs, salad greens, and produce. Look for more expert advice about choosing a tech-enabled traceability system in the August issue of Food Technology. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, CalSec. Visit calsec.com. That's K-A-L-S-E-C dot com. To connect with the Calsec team and find your path to natural products your customers will love and trust. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation and the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening. And join us again for our next episode.